everyone. Welcome to Palace Confidential, your weekly look at all things royal, brought to you from Mail Plus. I'm Jo Elvin and I've got another fascinating panel of experts this week. No pressure, guys. Uh, joining me this week is Dickie Arbiter, who was 12 years the Queen's press spokesman, royal correspondent and author Victoria Murphy, and another Dickie, the Daily Mail's diary editor, Richard Eden. Welcome to you all. Two dicks. We are so lucky. <laughs> Thank you for being here, all three of you today. Victoria, I'm going to start with you, the fragrant Victoria. Story appearing overnight about another Netflix project from the Sussexes. What do we know so far? Yeah, so this story, as you say, appeared overnight in the New York Post. Um, and it's claiming that, obviously, we know the Sussexes have a deal with Netflix, but as well as their series about the Invictus Games, there's also going to be what's described as a docu-series, which invites oh, docu -series. people... docu-series! <laughs> this is what it's been described as in the article, which invites people to see according to the story, into their home, see a bit more of their lives. Um, what's interesting about this is that there was a story a couple of years ago saying that the Sussexes were going to take part in some kind of reality show. And at the time, they issued an on-the-record denial saying they're not doing any reality shows. Now, is a docu-series different to a reality show? That's the question. And will they, they haven't responded to this so far, but I think it's going to be interesting to see how they do. Will they issue a statement saying we're not doing any docu-series? Um, so it's a bit unclear as to exactly what this is, and we haven't heard from them as to this story yet. What, what are you imagining the content might be, Richard Eden? There'll have to be some drama there in the docu-series. I'm loving that. I'm loving that technical differentiation between a, that and a reality show. The Kardashians do a reality yeah, yeah, show, yeah, the Sussexes yeah. do a docu-series. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, for any good fly-on-the-wall documentary, you know, you need some tension. You, you need drama, otherwise it's just boring, isn't it? You know, Netflix, you know, they really do want bang for their buck. You know, I think that um, Harry and Meghan, when they signed this multi-million pound deal with Netflix, envisaged them, themselves as sort of um, like the Obamas who'd be commissioning these really worthy series. Well, that's all been thrown out of the window. You know, Netflix have ditched um, Pearl, the, the very worthy animated series about sort of teenage girl inspired by Meghan. And instead, they're going for the, what they think will sell, which is a program about the Sussexes themselves. I wonder if there'll be any uh, conflict between the Sussexes and Netflix on that point of content, because I can well imagine that they thought that they could sit around talking about climate change in their kitchen. I imagine but, it's going to be a constant debate. I mean, look, yeah. they've always been keen to sort of keep the children out of the public eye. But then when they gave that interview to Oprah Winfrey, what did we see? But we saw Archie, you know, along the beach and we saw the first glimpses of family. So I'm sure Netflix, if they're paying that money, would expect to see the children as well. Mm. Dickie Arbiter, you imagine you're back in the royal press team <laughs> at this moment in time, which I'm sure you probably would <laughs> prefer not to at the moment. But how do you react to news like this? Because surely this will set alarm bells ringing at the palace. Well, the immediate reaction is, could it be any worse than Oprah? Uh, and my guess is probably not, unless there is some, really? unless there's an Oprah type figure there who's going to be asking all sorts of questions and not questioning their answers. This smacks of desperation because Netflix is hemorrhaging money. It's cut productions. It's got The Crown coming out in November, which is a very costly production. Harry's got his book coming out sometime either before or just after. And Netflix want to show this, what do you call it? A docu? Docu-series. Docu-series. To coincide with it all, I think it's it, it's max of desperation. It, it's it's a bit rich. Two people who left the UK walked out of the royal family because they wanted privacy. Uh, they've done nothing else but mm. put themselves up front, and and a week doesn't go by when there isn't some sort of statement coming out of their PR people. Mm. So yeah, probably alarm bells, but I don't think the alarm bells will be ringing as hard as they did during the Oprah interview. Well, I don't know. What do you think, Richard, if, you know, we talk a lot about how there's the establishment response to something like this and then there's the family response being that, you know, sometimes there's the blurred lines. But I imagine that there could well be a scenario in this Netflix docuseries where they're discussing all the headlines about, you know, all the, the tit for tat in the, in the family feuds. And so it does make me wonder what the family over here will be thinking. It really does. Remember that when Harry and Meghan came over to the Invictus Games in the Netherlands, they stopped over to visit the Queen, a sort of secret visit, and it emerged that they had a film crew with them on that visit. 
And we all thought, oh, that's just the same Netflix crew that's making the very worthy documentary about the Invictus Games. But it sounds like from this report in the New York Post as if actually they might also have been a film crew making this program. So obviously, you know, what we're thinking now is will they be bringing Netflix with them for the Jubilee celebrations. It's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? Imagine if there was like a fly on the wall situation where after they've left that meeting with the Queen, and the producers are outside going, "So Harry, yeah. what you know, what happened?" I mean, I yeah. have to say, I think we we don't know what the percentage is going to be focused on personal, what's going to be focused oh, but on it's work. Fun to yeah. speculate. So, so we don't. So we, so we have to be careful. But I, I would I would be surprised if they did talk a lot about other members of the royal family. But if they did, you know, I think we talk about privacy and we talk about them wanting to have control over their own privacy, control over their narrative. But in, in talking about other members of the family, you know, there's other people's privacy to consider here. This is other people's reputations and how other people are perceived. So I think, you know, to stray into that territory of, of talking about other members of the family would be quite significant. I, I personally think they might yeah. hold back yeah, from that, but let's say... They've already done it with Oprah. They've already done uh, it, and there's no way... Oh, that no, with, the, with Oprah they did, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And, and there's no they reason did. why, not... with this book coming out, well, there's no uh, that they shouldn't carry it further. Book. Surely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. With the book as well, yes. Yeah. I mean, it'd be interesting to see how much that affects. And it's, it's quite conceivable that what is in the book stories. might well come out, snippets of it, within the docu drama, whatever it is. Mm. Um, um, one aspect of this news report was that um, Netflix were very keen for the, um, the series to be broadcast this year to yeah. tie in with his. Um, Harry's memoirs, but... And The Crown. And Harry and Meghan were pushing back. Mm. They want it for next year. Well, that's interesting in itself as well, because you have two seemingly commercial deals with different people, one with a publisher, one with a production company, who that presumably there'll be a level of competition there about mm. about stories and content, you know? Yeah, well, Netflix so. have paid out. They want payback now. It's just fascinating to think that this it's come to this, but we'll have to think we'll just have to watch this space. But let's move on to Harry's brother now. Remember him? William and Victoria, it seemed like a mixed week for the Duke of Cambridge. On the one hand, a very important royal duty abroad. On the other hand, quite a nasty episode at a football match. Yeah, I mean, th this duty you're talking about visiting the UAE following the death of the Sheikh, he was representing the Queen in that role, and that's the first time he's done that. It's something that Prince Charles might have done were he not preparing for this trip to Canada and something that Prince Charles has done many times in the past. Obviously, the Queen doesn't do any overseas travel anymore. Um, it's a reminder, definitely, of... I mean, when you compare to 10 years ago, the, the increase in Prince William's responsibilities is huge. The role that he's now performing, the things that he's doing. And also, I think, a reminder of we do have a reduced number of working roles now. The Queen doesn't do very much. We've lost Harry and Meghan. Andrew doesn't do anything. And so these duties are things that need to be done. The monarchy needs to be represented. The Queen needs to be represented in this moment and people have to do it. Um, so it's a reminder really of all of those things. Um, but yes, as well this week he, he was, I mean to say he was booed feels like the wrong emphasis to put on it because um, it clearly was not a personal booing. It seems to be, from what I understand, more of a kind of anti-establishment feeling. Well, as anti-establishment personal sentiment. if you're part of the establishment. But that's the thing, and it is a reminder <laughs> yeah. that the royal family members, they don't just represent themselves. How they behave, what they do can affect how they're perceived, and that matters. But actually, they also represent an institution and in the establishment, and sometimes people will be reacting to that and not mm. to them personally. Mm. What do you make of the booze towards well, William Dickey? Well, I thought, I thought the whole thing was outrageous. And, uh, and as far as against the establishment, well, the royal family, um, they don't represent the establishment. Uh, the establishment is acting on, on their behalf. If what you call the establishment, is it the legal system in, in this case? Because it's all revolving around what happened at Hillsborough 34 years ago. Um, and that's, that, that's the interpretation anyway. I thought it outrageous. Uh, I thought the fact that Jurgen Klopp thought, yeah, it was fine, the uh, the Liverpool manager. I wonder if he'd feel the same way if fans booed in Germany Deutschland Lied, which is the national anthem, or those with long memories, Deutschland Uber Alles. I don't think so. And I think the fact that there were politicians who came out against what actually happened uh, at, at Liverpool at that, that cup final at Wembley. But there are a lot of politicians that didn't. Mm. Um, and it makes you wonder which side, whose side they're on. Mm. Do you think, though, it makes it gives any indication, Richard, to some sort of image management that the royal family needs to take charge of? 
Um, I think Prince William would have expected it. From what I've heard from the choir that performed, it was a gospel choir that performed the national anthem, they'd been warned to expect booze because Liverpool, um, some Liverpool fans have a history of booing. And there was also suggestions that William didn't take Prince George, who seems to love football, but he didn't take him for that reason, that mm. he didn't want any unpleasantness, which is a shame. But in, in terms of image management and so forth, I'm not sure he needs to pay too much attention. I think it's a, a one-off, and I don't think it's any reflection on William's popularity. Let's leave that one there for now. But uh, the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall are away this week on a whistle-stop tour to Canada as part of celebrations for the Platinum Jubilee. And the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, is, of course, with them, and she sent us this report. This week, I'm in Canada with the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall as they undertake a Platinum Jubilee visit on behalf of the Queen at the invitation of the Canadian government. Now, if anyone thinks these trips are a jolly, they should think again. They're here for 72 hours. They're traveling 9,000 miles door to door. On Tuesday, it was a 23 hour working day. And uh, today they packed in 10 engagements. There's a similar number tomorrow before they fly back to the UK. Now that's actually a pretty typical working day for the Prince of Wales, who is a notorious workaholic. But I think one thing that is very different about this particular royal tour is the lack of pomp and ceremony. And I think that's very deliberate. Post the trip to the Caribbean by the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and the Earl and Countess of Wessex earlier this year, which were criticised in some quarters for maybe looking a little colonial at times. And I think that's why we've seen far less big set pieces than he normally would do on a royal tour and more chances for Charles and Camilla to get out and about to meet Canadians, particularly members of the indigenous communities here. One senior royal aide I was speaking to before we came away said, look, the Prince of Wales has been doing this for more than 50 years. He's really adept at these royal tours, but he never stops listening. He never stops learning. He never stops evolving. And I think that's actually what we've seen and put into practice here. Rebecca English there. Let's bring my panel back in now. And Victoria, it seems that acknowledging the effects of colonialism is going to become an essential part of every royal trip now. Well, you know, it's a conversation that is being had around the world. And I think we've seen from the trips to the Caribbean how important it is for the royal family to strike the right tone when they visit countries where the legacy of colonialism is being discussed widely. And, you know, when you have Commonwealth realms, you have this kind of dual thing going on because you have the history and you have the stories about calls for apologies, calls for reparation, but you also have the present because the Queen remains head of state in the realms and that in itself causes debate. So you have these two things going on. And I think what it is clearly very important for the royal family to do and what Prince Charles has done on this trip, I think, is is go in up front and acknowledge that these conversations are happening and make a point of saying very clearly, we are here to listen, we understand what people are talking about. And Charles did devote quite a big section of his opening speech to that. And he also paid his respects um, at a heart garden, which is a memorial to the children who were victims of the residential schools. And I think that is perhaps what we saw lacking in the Caribbean trip was this kind of upfront acknowledgement of the conversation. So Prince William said at the end of the trip, we support your decisions to make choices about your future, referring to countries choosing not to have the Queen as head of state anymore. But had he said that at the beginning of the trip, it could have perhaps changed how some of the things have played out. So when um, Jamaica's Prime Minister said to him, you know, we're moving on. That could have played out quite differently if Prince William had already said before that, you know, we support your decisions 
to make your choices. And so I think we see the importance of tackling this up front. And that's what I think Charles has done on this trip. I think it's important that these tours don't become one long apology. Um, you know, they're there to mark the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. They're there representing the Queen. And the same as in the Caribbean. Um, it's It should be a celebration. And we don't want to turn these... They, they just become redundant if the whole foreign tour is just one long, miserable apology. You know, let's celebrate. I mean, sure, it's it's good that um, Charles has, um, you know, apologised at the beginning and got that out of the way. But let's make sure that their celebrations more than sort of negative apologising for the state, apologising for this. But we might not have ultimate control over that as, as, as well, the royal family may not, might they, Victoria? This seems to be something that could shape a whole new phase for royal tours. Yeah, I mean, Charles didn't didn't apologise. He did stop short of an apology, which was, was what some people were calling for. Um, but, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, what we're seeing with the Charles trip, actually, there's quite a lot riding on this trip because of... They, even though there were some positive moments in the Caribbean tours and even though some people feel that some of the criticism was unfair, there's no doubt about it that overwhelming that na narrative attached to those visits will be con controversy and they'll be remembered for that. And I don't think that will be the case for this trip to Canada. And I think that there was quite a lot riding on it for that reason. And we're seeing the Prince Charles presenting himself in a way and the things that he's doing are not fueling this negative narrative at all. And I think that's quite important. So I think the legacy of this particular trip will not add to what we saw in the Caribbean. What is actually quite interesting is that the, the apology, apologies are coming from people who want it in the realm states. You go to the African continent, which is a part of the Commonwealth, you go to West Africa, where the slave market was rife, there is no rumbling there. There have been no rumblings there during royal tours there. You've got to apologise. We want to, we want an apology. But it is the realm states who feel that, well, you're our head of state or you're the heir to the, to the head of state, therefore you're the ones that should be apologising. It's really governments that should be apologising, not the royal family. Mm. Does this, how does this compare to your day doing royal tours? Did this t kind of thing take This never up? cropped up. Right. Never cropped up. I mean, I, I, I did something like 22 royal tours. Uh, admittedly, a lot of them were to foreign countries, but a lot of them were to the Commonwealth. Um, but no, it, it's not something that ever cropped up. What was your... Um emotions when you were gearing up for a royal tour? Delighted, excited, dread? Did you, do you have some fond memories of those, those I've times? I've got a lot of fond memories about royal tours, but there were a lot of hard work. There was no, there was no time for, for resting. I mean, we heard from Rebecca English that, that uh, they're, they're sort of going hither and thither and they're yeah, working long 23 hours. 23 hour day or something, did you say? It, it is a long yeah. day because uh, you, you finish the day late evening and, and if you're a press secretary, which I was, with Charles and Diana, you're up again at six o'clock, sort of walking the ground of where they're gonna go the next day. Um, it doesn't mean to say that because you finish at 11 o'clock the night before you go straight to bed, you're lucky if you get about four hours sleep uh, before you're back on the road again. You worked on adrenaline mm. uh, in the hope that it was all gonna work well because you weren't only looking after the principals, but you were also looking after the media. And there's usually, with Charles and Diana, anything up to 200 people following them. That's just from the British media. That's not about the host country media. Oh, I feel a bit sick now. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the Queen now and Victoria after weeks of not seeing her. She's back. Yeah. What are and your thoughts? It was really, I think, for a lot of people, we find that very reassuring to see her out and about in two engagements in very quick succession, looking really good, uh, looking you know, relatively robust. She had been looking pretty frail in previous months. Um, I think it has been quite jarring because we went from this period of COVID where there, weren't, there wasn't a normal timetable. And so perhaps that meant that when the Queen came back, and started to do things in person and then suddenly had to pull right back and her timetable scared right back and she hadn't been able to attend so many things that she's attended in previous years. It felt very sudden and very jarring. Um, but to see her out and about does send that message that she still wants to be seen, she still wants to be out about when she can. She's had to accept that there's certain things she can't do. Um, then there is a new reality now with her timetable, absolutely. But she's still going to be at things and she's still going to be visible. And that bodes well for the Platinum Jubilee. But, Richard, what did you read into, if anything, that she couldn't attend the opening of Parliament, that she was at the Royal Horse Show? 
Mm. <laughs> I, I think it is significant, and yeah. it, it does seem to be part of a sort of handover to Prince Charles. Yeah, that I think she's choosing. It's lovely to see she seems to be sort of choosing a retirement almost in the sense that she's going to things she enjoys, like the, the horse show near, near her home, and then making that surprise visit um, at Paddington Station to launch the Elizabeth line, which was terrific to see because we've heard a lot about her mobility issues, but there the Queen was resplendent in yellow, you know, managing to walk around, with, yes, with the help of a walking stick. And so I think she's been given a real lease of life by the celebrations, and I'm sure she'll want to attend as much as she can. And then some of the boring formalities, yeah, she can leave that to her eager air. And do you think that's fair enough to, to sort of for her to be focusing now on the more fun stuff? It, it, you... It's reasonably fair enough. I, I was at the horse show last Friday and Saturday and she turned up Friday and there was a tremendous cheer and standing ovation from the crowd when, when she did arrive. But Richard mentioned about doing the Royal Windsor Horse Show on Sunday for the show and, and not Parliament. She gave up the cenotaph uh, in 2017 because of steps uh, at her age in, it's walking backwards and there was concern mm -hmm. that she would stumble. Now opening Parliament uh, she would go up to the Royal, uh, Royal Robing Room by lift, a hundred foot walk through the um, Royal Gallery to the Lord's Chamber which meant going up steps uh, and that would have presented a problem to her, going up and going down again. She had knee operations in 2003, one in January, one in December. Uh, and I think once you've had a knee operation, it's going to come back and haunt you. Mm. Here we are, uh, 19 years on, and she's still having knee, knee problems. And that's part and parcel of her immobility. Plus the fact she got COVID, and that takes a long time to... Uh, to come out of, and she is 96, so we've got to give a bit of bit of leeway here that there are things she can do and things she can't do. She would do as much as possible, and what we've got coming up, we've got Trooping the Colour on the 2nd of June, we've got the Thanksgiving service on the 3rd of June, we've got a balcony appearance um, on the 2nd of June, so she will do as much as she possibly can. She doesn't want to let people down, it's and most of all, she doesn't want to let herself down. It's like you still work there. You can just reel off those dates, those engagements. <laughs> That's incredible. It never leaves you, but we have to leave you now, sadly. That is all we have time for on Palace Confidential this week. My thanks to Victoria Murphy, Rebecca English, Dickie Arbiter, Richard Eden, and to you, of course, for watching. Stick around as we have something special to play out the programme. Tonight, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge will attend the premiere of Top Gun Maverick in Leicester Square. And to mark the occasion, we thought we'd take a trip down memory lane, looking at some of our favourite pictures of royals on red carpets. Enjoy that and we will see you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>